there's two types of roles you either have, right? You have a, a learn role and earn role. There's a lot of learning by working in a school as, as the IT manager because you are the only IT person. Yeah. So you end up being the database administrator, the sysadmin, the desktop guy, the networking guy, the web design guy. The exciting part of being in technology, I think, is that you're always, um, always exposed to something. It's almost the foundations of a CIO role, right? If you think, what, mm. what does a CIO really do? CIOs cross lots of different things and deals with stakeholders every day. It sounded like a game of Monopoly. You were kind of going around collecting government departments as you kind of went in South Australia. But as, as a senior leader, you probably can run your team off sites, but should you run your team off sites? Being a, being a CIO, you, you're, you're not the smartest person in the room anymore, right? You know, and you, 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 there's no way you're ever going, going to be. I think the, the biggest thing I learned from that from that role was, was um, well, Simon Rita, an accomplished CIO, renowned for his distinctive career in digital transformation. Recognised as a top 50 CIO and digital transformation executive in Australia, Simon brings over 23 years of dynamic experience in the ICT industry. His expertise spans across various sectors, from education to financial services, at organisations such as South Australia Police, South Australia Health, Defence Health, Court Services, Aware Super, and now with Seabus Property. Today, you'll hear how Simon built his career from the grassroots of desktop support and how moving to Melbourne helped him step up to the next level and fully realise his career ambitions. Alrighty. Um, so Simon, thank you for taking the time out today to, to come and talk to me and, and sharing your story. Um, you, you've been named as one of the top 50 CIOs in Australia uh, and you've had a fantastic career working your way from desktop support to CIO. Um, and I'm sure that journey hasn't always been a, a smooth path. Um, and I'm really looking forward today to just learning a bit more about, about that journey. Um, and when I look back at your career, I can see that uh, from a LinkedIn and a resume perspective, it, it started at the Department of Education and Children um, Services in, in South Australia. But there must have been something before that. So I'm, I'm interested in sort of what was going on as you were coming out of high school and uh, how did you kind of find yourself in, in tech? Yeah, it's a good, good question. Thank, thanks for having me on the on the show. Um, so the uh, you're yeah, going going back. You know, obviously a South Australian South Australian boy from um from from I guess you know from birth really. But the um the I was like to grow up in uh, McLaren Vale. So for those who, who like wine, probably know where that is. Um, down down there, and there was a there was a school, um, called Wollongong High School, uh, which which was basically the the district school for that whole whole southern region. And back then, it was very um. A lot more regional than it is, it is today. A lot more built up today, but but been in very country, um, you know. So there was there was um, you know about eight hundred thousand kids at that school. Um, eight hundred thousand. Eight hundred. Eight hundred to a thousand. <laughs> um, it had about it had, interesting enough though. It had the one of the biggest biggest school bus bus networks in in um, in the okay. state. So we had about um, I think about forty or fifty different buses you could go right. on. So in the school day, you go out the front and there's just buses everywhere. So because <laughs> um, they had all the buses going to all the different regions, all the country towns, and all the stuff yeah. around the area. Um, obviously, move all those kids around. Being being, you know, being a regional school, so um, you know, it, it went went through there. Um, I think you know the, the passion for technology you know, stems all the way back to back to your, back to your childhood. Really, I mean, it's um, always tinkering with with you know electronic electrical goods, electrical, electrical um, things, mechanical things, getting that getting that eye for how how things work and all those questions as a, as a kid. And I remember as um, always, my um, used to always ask my parents, you know, how how does that work and why does it work that way and you know, all those types of questions around that because, you know, always that curious mindset, I guess. Um, yeah, going through that and going through school, you know, really, really took on, you know, back back in the day, there wasn't really um, wasn't really computing classes as such in my, in my early early schooling. So I did a lot of, um, a lot of interest in doing a lot of the um, electrical training. So we had a lot of yeah. um, electrical classes in school. We had typing. We actually had typewriters for the first first couple of years in school. Um, <laughs> so did did some of that. Not not because you know, I want to be a great typist, but it's um, which actually comes in handy now being in the job I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's more around just understanding um, you know their interest in, in sort of t- technology, I guess. Um, and so you know sort of building up to you know, use, using using computers and their interests as they came along. Um, you know obviously you know before school I was in when well, I was in um, in primary school we. Um, had a Commodore 64, probably my first first real computer. Play around yeah. with that a lot. Um, lots of good fun with with that one. Um, you know, in, inbuilt screen time uh, controls for your kids <laughs> yeah. because you had to wait 30 minutes for it to load anything. So um, you know, you had to go off and have a break, yeah. which was always good. So um, went from that. Then it basically went, you know, got tinkering around, and, and I remember getting my my first PC, which was like an old you know old 386 type of thing with four yeah. meg of RAM and you know very very yeah. um, you know twenty meg hard drive I think. Um, and playing around with that for a lot, and learning, learning a lot with that. I broke, broke it a lot. I mean, I mean, I played with it, broke it, 
um, figured out how to fix it. So I've always had that passion. But um, and I also went through school, and then obviously as school school evolved. You got more more through through high school. You get more more senior. Um, the technology came along so yeah, without having um, you know, Mac, Macs in all the in some of the computer rooms. You got PCs coming through, so you got that technology change came through. Um, it was amazing at the time because we had. Um, I remember you had a 128k internet connection for the entire school, <laughs> um, which which was um, which was was amazingly fast back then because because back home you had you know dial up at yeah. 14 point, 14 point four <laughs> whatever it was right. Um, so that was you know it was great to use that and then you sort of getting play and, and sort of knowing and sort of just picking up. Um, yeah, from about year ten, um, I started helping out the um, the IT manager in school. So so yeah. um, so he, he was looking after the actual IT systems, and I think that was probably my first real um, first real mentor, I guess, of your career. We were going, well, you know, I had an interest in technology, and, and that, that IT manager back then sort of picked up on that, um, and they actually you know he actually let me help out with some things, learn, learn a bunch of stuff, help set the rooms up, um, you know, learn, learn how to you know. Um, wipe some of the windows, the old, the old DOS machines, and rebuild them, and, and yeah. stuff like that. And went through the whole school journey. The, the, the school, um, the school also, as, as I got some more senior, they said because um, they knew I had an interest in it, and through the IT manager, I guess, going to, to the stuff, they said, um, if you get enough kids, we'll, we'll run a computing class um, in my last couple of years of school, and, and we did. So we actually had a computing class there of, of some kids, uh, which is great. And they also, um, for my um, in South Australia, they call it the South Australian Certificate of Education, which is basically your VCE in Victoria yeah, okay. equivalent to. Um, basically, for one of those, I, I could um, I end up helping the IT manager for a whole a whole subject a whole subject every every week. Yeah. So I could I could actually um, and dropped a dropped a subject and helped helped him out with um, a lot of the actual networking and, and sys- basic desk- desktop support and sysadmin work. Um, and basically kept a journal of what I was learning, and that essentially that's how I was assessed um, yeah, assessed right. for that. So that's how I sort of got into into technology very early. So. Yeah, you know, pretty, pretty thanks to the school for being very, um, very supportive of that. With also the IT manager for, for recognizing my, my passion, and sort of helping me, you know, get get some hands on earlier than probably what a lot of other people have got. Um, That's great, isn't it? Because I think, particularly when you're coming through high school, a lot of kids will gravitate towards sport or they'll gravitate towards academics. Yep. Um, but being in a school that kind of, I guess, identified that and, and really fostered that in you is. It's fantastic. Yeah, it was good. Well, it wasn't wasn't great at sport. You know, I had the height for obviously being quite yeah. good at volleyball and basketball <laughs> and other things. But um, <laughs> but you know, I just was, wasn't you know wasn't one wasn't my passion. So it's just um, that was, that was good. It was, it was really enjoyable. And I, you know, I, re- I look back on those years quite quite fondly with what I learned and also just just the just the exposure and yeah, it was a general positive schooling experience. So did you leave high school then and go straight into work, or what was that kind of transition in in those kind of years? Yeah, so I went to uh, went to went to TAFE. Because uh, I was kind of looking at looking at doing my um, my diploma of IT uh, through there, um, but in parallel to that, um, I sort of got picked, picked, ended up picking up a job um, at the same high school I went to. Yeah, right. Um, as afterwards, so I got got a um, for originally it was eight hours uh, eight hours a week I think doing some part time work there. But you know back then being being a being a TAFE student living at home still you know that was still that was plenty of money back then. So yeah, it's, right. Um, That's a fortune. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> it was. So it was um it was all, it all worked pretty well. Uh, went went through um. Went through, did, did a bunch of formal training, worked there part time, um, and I sort of landed um, after that. I landed my first full time school job um, in another school. The, the way it works with the, the education department back then um, is basically you can register as a um, on this on the staffing pool, yeah. um, and in other schools as they, as they need it. someone, they look through that pool. Yeah, look like an internal talent database, right? Yeah, and they go, oh yeah, and so I got a call from a from a school. Um, and then they went went worked there and did, did, did a year there and, and um, got worked at another school and eventually worked at a whole bunch of schools like yeah, that okay. and, just, and yeah, I think that was quite good. I mean, there was a lot of um, a lot of learning by working in a school as, as the IT manager because you are the only IT person. Yeah. So you end up being the database administrator, the sysadmin, the desktop guy, the networking <laughs> guy, the web design guy, the Mac support guy, the Wi-Fi guy. No, it was it's every every role the in IT, guy. the photocopier guy, the fax machine, <laughs> um, everything. So every, every, everything, everything that has a has a PowerPoint basically. Oh, Simon, yeah. can you come help me fix it? So, um, and by, by necessity, you're forced to learn either yeah. through and you do it through the two way. You, you, you know, back then you use, use the internet as, as slow as it was, um, or you end up calling up. You know, um, some people I knew, some people I knew. So yeah. either some of the people I knew from from TAFE, or um, that you know the IT manager yeah. from the school originally. Yeah, you know, obviously kept in contact with him for for many years um, as well, um, and obviously you know. Hey, hey, I've got this weird problem. What does yeah. this really mean? That kind of stuff. So I'm um, getting a lot of coaching with that. So, so that's interesting. So that, so I guess your progression to Department of Education, given that you've worked in schools, is probably a natural yeah. um, end, end point for you. And I think 
what I was interested there is is, is that role was was desktop support, yep. essentially, um, which, as you say, it's kind of literally you're at the coal face, and you're also probably dealing with people when they're at their most stressed and under pressure because they're there, they want to do their job, and their computer won't work, and yep. they probably don't. This is a generalization, but probably don't have the technical appreciation of what's gone wrong. Um, so, what did that kind of teach you, I guess, about technology and, and the kind of world of early uh, entry yeah. into stakeholder management? I suppose is what. I'm yeah, thinking. yeah, it's, it's spot, spot on. So, I think you know, early years in the school, it, it's all about um, you know, t- you, a lot of technical learning, right? Like how how mm. to use, like te- a lot of technical specialist training. Um, you know, going to that, that 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 desktop role where it was more around providing support for um, for for a bunch of schools in in a, in a region. So that the way they they split it up. You had your corporate desktop support, and then your your sort of your school desktop support. If, if the schools didn't have an IT person, or if back then, um, or they um, the the onsite IT person couldn't fix something, they they yeah. called up this, this this central group that came out. So sort of working for them, which is good at that because because you kind of end up going, you're know, looking after about fifty different schools, um, and you go out to those, and it's um a lot of it is stakeholder management. You, you you've got kindergartens you're going to where yeah. you've got um you know you've got there is no IT person at all like it's just the principal and early learning center coordinator um and working working with them around how can you get that up and running and working and obviously you know um it is stressful because if something's not working they need those systems for a reason yeah um you also learn a lot about time management as well because how you book your day and especially mm. the thing the logistics and, and and challenges also learning a lot around um always bring spares of everything you can think of <laughs> because when you're out somewhere the last thing you want to do is say to someone oh on, you need a replacement of X, and then having to spend it all the way back, yep. and getting it again right. So, learning to bring a lot of spare equipment, mm. um, looking at you know looking at how you could you can manage time, and also stake, you know, stakeholders to keep up, you know, managing those those expectations of. Um, you know, the, the main thing I always thought was you know, if I'm going to be there, you be there by a certain time, or if you can't be there by a certain time, so I'll be there early afternoon, or you try and give some yeah. guidelines to people so they actually understand. Um, so really establishing that that uh, that kind of confidence. In, in your customer, so, yeah. to, so to yeah. speak, in, in different contexts. Say it could be a kindergarten. Yep. I can imagine you saw some pretty interesting things. Uh, yeah, through, through, through uh, does that. And then uh, in, in high schools, right, it was probably my customer was probably more of the actual IT manager. So in the larger yeah. high schools, you, you probably had, you know, one or two IT people actually on site. Um, so I was going out and doing things either for them, right, things that specific for them. So, um, so you had that right through for stakeholders from being technical stakeholders right through to being teachers to being principals to being everything in between. So yeah. very, very group. Um, but it was, you know, it was a great, great experience again from you know, that technical stream going up and then also then the stakeholder side. Yeah. It was sort of quite well-rounded by the time I sort of finished my journey at the Department of Education. Yeah, and I saw after that, so it was after about three years actually, I saw you move to South Australia Police. Yep. Um, again, in desktop support, but as a senior desktop support. Yep. And I was just interested in how did that differentiate as you kind of went up into a senior role? What what kind of, how did that stretch you in a different way? Yeah, um, it was pretty more, you know, and I know initially in that role, um, well, I struggled, I struggled with not being at the coalface of technology, technolo- mm. technology all the time. Um, and people. So in that role, yeah, you still provide support. Um, you, you always got the more curly ones. Yeah. Being being senior, which is which is okay. But you also do a lot more project work. So that was my introduction, really doing a lot okay. more project type of work. So yeah. um, your goal of you know if everyone remembers back in technology back in the day, you used to build gold images for desktops. Um, what was the you know the gold the gold SOA build that you sort of had to have on the disk somewhere? So I used to go off and spend a lot of time building those, right? Yeah. Or um, looking at ways we could we could deploy security patches back then before. Before things we have now, like modern technologies, yeah. like you know, yeah, Intune and stuff that do it kind of for us, the Windows update it didn't really exist back then. So yeah, it's off um, the disk. I'm assuming. Yeah, we used to disk, or we used to send stuff out to uh, like file transfers to some regional file server, then run yeah. some VB script at the start when they turn on to copy file patches across and all sorts of stuff like that. Right, it was all very um, yeah, all very messy days back then. Um, but that, then yeah, that's essentially what you had to do back back in the day. So yeah. it was a lot more project work around that. Um, also a lot more structure. So being being um, being police, there was, there, was, there was a few things. One was obviously um, uh, a lot more structure around change management was a lot more critical because we actually had a obviously being a twenty four by seven organisation, running critical service of f- services yeah. for the state. We had the triple zero call center in there as well. So you had to think about how you actually mm. you actually think about how, how actually deploy updates to those machines or how actually do servicing to those machines. Well, so that's also just just to jump in. That's interesting because we've obviously had the recent uh, Optus outage. Yeah, and you saw the impact there on triple zero, right? With yep. people not being able to make through. So you you don't think about those things, but I could imagine, yeah, back then even the technology was would have been nowhere near as advanced. So probably more pressure on that system. 
It was. We, we used to have um. Or we used to have you know four, four different um. One shift, but four four different uh, four different pods they can move to. So that if something did break, they can at least right. jump to another machine quickly enough. Um, early form of disaster recovery. Early form of disaster recovery, <laughs> right? We'll give you another physical machine that you can jump to. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it was one of the things around um, moving more to that project work. Um, yeah. It was also introduction to a lot more, probably a lot more structure. Education obviously was more school based. Schools driving what they wanted to do with head office <coughs> across the top. Yeah, police is very different. Whereas police headquarters pushing out this is the policy. There's a lot, a lot of rank rank and. You know, there's certain ranks to work within as well. And there's also different deadlines. You know, there's just some great, um, you know, deadlines to get files restored. And one, one example I had, um, I had to fly out to one of the regional police stations in, in, in South Australia and um, replace one of the machines uh, at the um, at the, this regional police station. Middle of nowhere, so you fly, you know, fly in this plane, you land, it's all red sands, very, very regional. Yeah. Um, the plane's there for six hours before it flies back with a shift change for the next two weeks. So if you're on that plane <laughs> six hours, you're, you're good. If you're not, then you're there for another two weeks, right? So <laughs> there's a lot of pressure around, I need to get that fixed in that time. So again, learning from my previous job, take a little spare parts you think you need <laughs> yeah. um, along. Uh, and that was, the reason I got there for that was because there was a um, there was a court case, they needed to file it, the evidence was on that particular machine. Yeah. They needed it restored to, to the um, lieutenant at the time, could go to the court case and run, run the it's incredible. Run the file. So you know, it, was, it, was all, it was all very driven by very, um, very you know, those types of demands. So. Yeah. Um, de- deadlines are one of those things. Well, le- learning, I think, also reiterated a lot in that role around um, mean deadlines. Yeah. So, because it was actually real, real, real life circumstances. And, you know, in, in, in most jobs, you, you miss the deadline. They're usually artificially imposed by some manager that says, yeah. I need X by this date. 99% of the time, they're flexible. But, yeah. but in an organization <laughs> that runs critical <laughs> services, right, you, they're, they're not flexible. So, yeah, they're, they're, right. they're there for a particular reason. There's, there's actual real consequences to it. And you moved from that role, uh, your next role I saw was as uh, ICT manager at South Australian Museum. Yep. yep. Um, you're probably trying to remember what you did next. Like, no, 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 that's fine. Um, and that, and that's, that sounds like a, a big step up from, from uh, desktop. Yep. Um, yep. So how did you, how did you, do, how did that kind of push you out your comfort zone? Yeah, it was good. It was a good one. It was also coincidentally, I think it was roughly about the same time night the museum came out, the movie. So every, <laughs> yeah. everyone, everyone for about the first year was always like, oh, what's it like there at night time, right? So yeah. Um, um, and that, nothing moved. If everyone's wondering at night time, so I can just confirm. They destroyed the dream. <laughs> <laughs> confirm nothing moved. Um, but yeah, that, that was yeah, it was right. It was a um, it was a they, it was a new role. So they, there was a um, so it was new for them too. So it was, it was a learning experience for both. So that was a new role. Um, they had created. They used to outsource their IT support. They bring it in house. Yeah. So it was, um, they hired me. Um, I came along. The obviously learning a lot from. Initially, it's probably more. It's probably more as an IT manager. It's probably more around uh, as a um, being that there's no one there. It's probably more of like, like a desk, senior desktop role anyway, because yeah, yeah. initially it's providing support to um, all the staff at the museum plus all the scientists. So there's, there's about hundred hundred odd scientists at the Australian Museum back then. And yeah, about hundred hundred odd staff roughly, and you all the all, all the also the technology at the front of the house that um, all those touch screens and stuff you use to have the interactive experience. Um, but, you know, it was really um, interesting from the point of view that. Providing that that support, building up the IT function, so learning all of the structure I had from from police around um, putting in the help desk platform, for example. Even though it was just me there initially, originally as the IT manager, just so I could track my own workload. Yeah, and I learned that you know that's a, that was an introduction. But then that helped because as as it grew, um, by the time I left, we, we had a couple IT staff there because as as, the, as it yeah, grew okay. and it became more of a, a, a service that people actually saw the value of because that's the another interesting thing when you in source IT for the first time. Yeah, um, it goes from being a I want support saying it's broken, like a reactive type of service, to all of a sudden, oh, well, you have more proactive conversations. Yeah. As in ways you could do things better. Uh, well, you, well, outsourcers generally don't do that. They'll just, yeah. they'll just go, well, you want a spoon? I gave you a spoon. That's it. Right? There's, yeah. there's no, there's no, there's no conversation in between. Go, well, actually, maybe, maybe while I'm here, I give you, I give you a knife too, because it looks like what you're eating needs a knife and a spoon, right? So, yeah. um, so that, that was a big, big shift as well, and that's probably where I learned a lot more around, um, probably a lot more of the strategic planning. Yeah. Uh, more insights of business plans, of developing, maintaining the IT budget was also part, part of that role too. So the introduction to budgeting. Um, it's also probably a very, this is my assumption, which, which may be wrong, but a very traditional environment, a museum, in terms of you say you've got researchers and you've yep. got archives and, and, and documents and so forth. I guess it's starting to kind of move them into the modern way of working. Uh, again, still that stakeholder engagement side of things. Pretty, pretty much so. We had a... Um, there was also a lot of scientists that had grants from universities, and then they had a whole bunch of equipment that came from the university. Yeah. So how you, how you actually work through that from you know, trying to think about IT security, 
and then try and look at how you have this new introduced equipment as yeah, well. Right. So, um, you know, that, that was also quite quite an educational experience around how you learn to, um, I guess it's, it's the introduction to almost like what's, what's risk appetite. Mm. So now, you know, as, as, a, as a CEO now, you, you talk a lot about budgets, risk appetite, risk tolerance. Yeah. Um, but, but then, you know, you, 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 didn't, you sort of knew it was probably a risk, but how you, how you, how you articulate it, you probably, didn't, you probably went across the frameworks as much being yeah. sort of in that role from my background um, as you would expect. So, so you know, that early introduction to that's a risk, how we actually make sure we, we mitigate that risk. Yeah, great. And uh, I think you, once done as you then moved on, uh, and you went to the Department of Treasury and Finance. Uh, yep. We spent about four years and three promotions. So yep. obviously a very successful time for you. But what I read on your resume, uh, I quite love the, the, the detail actually. It said uh, you, you kind of moved up to infrastructure manager and it said 500 employees, multiple locations, 180 servers, 400 apps well, yeah, yeah, um, apps, yeah. and 13 direct reports. And I thought, yep. again, you can see the progression. You know, you're yeah. kind of you're moving through these kind of sets, and also, by the way, it, it sounded like a game of Monopoly. You were kind of going around collecting government departments as you kind of went in South Australia. But that's, that's pretty much, yeah, it was was almost <laughs> like that. But yeah, South, South Australia itself is a very um, it, it governs a big employer over there. It's just government yeah. defence. Um, yes, I guess okay. you go either two routes. I ended up through government just because I started in, in the education space. I was just that natu- natural evolution. The, the other interesting thing over there with government is that your um, your sick leave and long service, service leave annually follows you around. You're right. It's just a different department. So you start a new job and you've got, you know, six months of annual leave right there, right? So so it's um so it's also a, a unique, unique perspective where right. you um you might change jobs. It's a benefit. But you have all the benefits of your last job, so um, and tenure. And it's long good. service leave counts too, actually, as you move towards departments. Yeah, okay. So so yeah. it's um that's clever actually, isn't it? Because it incentivizes people to stay in government. Yeah, which which yeah. and look if you look at it, you've built a brilliant career through that by taking the next step, the next step, the yep, next yep. step. And um, but I'm interested there. That that's pretty big. Five hundred employees, say thirteen reports, the service, the applications and stuff. How did you approach that? How did you kind of approach that next step up again in your career? It was a um so by the time I left the museum we had a had a couple of staff there by that point. So I was I was kind of used to managing staff. Well well, you know, um, SA police, I was probably senior you were kind of technically managing staff, but not really, right? You, can't, you, weren't, you weren't responsible for the performance management and, and that kind of stuff, but you were kind of guiding them technically. SM Museum had a couple by the end where they were, you, were, you were performance managing them and doing all the you know, pay reviews and all that kind of stuff you usually do. Um, going into Treasury, uh, that was probably my first real leadership role, right, as, as, as yeah, a team leader right. initially before I got up to, to the manager. And that was just pure luck because I started as a team leader originally then a big project came along to replace the revenue system for taxation in, in yep. South Australia. The, um, and then, then that my manager went to that project full time. And um, then I said, oh, well, Simon, you're here. So how about you do the job as, as acting for, for, for the company? So it's just kind of being in the right place at the right time. Um, and obviously, yeah, if I wasn't good at my job, they probably wouldn't, got, wouldn't tap me on the shoulder either. We're going to market, yep. but, you know, a bit of that too. But... Um, but again, that, that was a, that was a great role. You know, it was it was also my first you know first true leadership role. The good thing about being a team leader, I guess, is you still can be a little bit hands on. Yeah, and I think. But this is where I started to really get to that part of what do I actually want to do with my career at this point? Because because it kind of before this was re, it was still you're still hands on technical. Yeah, still doing technical things. Uh, in this role, you kind of go to um, in in this type of organisation. It's like, well, okay, I'm now a team leader, I pick and I delegate a lot of the work and prioritize workload and you know, all that kind of stuff. But you still can still can do some technical things, but generally not, not it's a little more like, you know, 10% yeah. what you do. Um, so you started at that point, I started reflecting a lot more, do I, do I want to be a technical specialist and, and mm. go and start to really, you know, do some deep dive certifications in, um, you know, back then VMware or yeah. Microsoft servers or whatever it was. Um, and that's because my, my passion, I drive become that. Um, or do I go down the leadership path? Mm. And I think, you know, reflecting on, on the role and the decision I made at the time was obviously, obviously to get to the leadership path, but it's more because I actually enjoyed talking to people. So I actually enjoyed the, the people side more. Um, it was a great team at, at Treasury. We, had, we, we, had, we did a lot of work, um, but we had a lot of fun as well, which is, which is also, also great. So I think, you know, having a team you actually enjoy working in is, 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 is very important. But it's, it's around, um, that's when I decided that for me, it's just, I just, Love talking to people. Love love mentoring people. I love love having conversations. You love love um, yeah. you know. And I was actually quite good at translating the technical technical things to the non technical stakeholders across. You know, we had you had you had ministers in treasury that came to you with, with questions yeah. of ministry advisors. You had um you had you know a lot because treasury had treasury had about four or five departments underneath its umbrella. Um, you had all these different CEOs of, of those departments as well. So yeah. there's a lot of, lot of um, <coughs> 
taking all those stakeholder management I learned from pre yeah. previous roles, right? It was, it, was, it was that role was really a lot around that. So, um, and that's what I enjoyed doing. So I, at that point, I sort of decided, um, probably decided after I was, I was doing the um, the manager role with, with the going across the project, I, I got into that role. Whereas I, at that point, I sort of concreted, well, this is what I actually enjoy doing. So um, did that surprise you? As in, when you're kind of leaving high school, you may have a kind of idea of who you are and what you stand for and then you kind of get five ten years in your career and you kind of look and think oh actually i'm not the person i thought it was yeah no i did originally i always thought well you know back back going back a bit i always thought probably my style of high school i was i want to be a pilot right so you always go with some some passion you want to be yeah um but then but then it the, 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 the didn't happen so what well, um, did, you, did you pursue that did you um no no i, I think it's just it's just one of those things where you kind of just um you, know, you kind of just you just didn't just got sidetracked with the technology side, right? So, yeah. but flying, yeah, flying still fascinates me, and then I, I, yeah. I fly. I'm, I'm fortunate I fly a fair bit, but um, yeah, but yeah, always the planes. It's always, 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 always that you know, it's, it's, it's a um, so it's an aura, aura of aura of amazement, right? About yeah. the whole being, a, being a, um, flying around, but um, but yeah, you get into that. It, it did surprise me at a point to a point because it was that, and then, I was, then I was, as I was finishing school, I was kind of debating, you know, yeah, if I was if I wasn't tapped on the show to get into IT and start working part time at the so I didn't get you know, helping out the IT manager at the school. Yeah, you know, I was probably thinking about becoming becoming an electrician, right? Because because again, yeah. that whole passion around just just that whole that kind of stuff works. Yeah. Um. So it's just interesting how to have pivoted towards that, and then I kind of just you know grew, grew from the you know grew from there through through each role. Um. And each role had its own challenges, and you kind of just you kind of just evolved <laughs> from that. And you know now now I'll probably still still find being an electrician interesting. I um. I, don't, I think I think I'm beyond that point now. I've changed I've changed your career, right? So <laughs> you never know. You never <laughs> I never know. Never know. <laughs> but it's um, it is interesting, and you think also your your trajectory has probably mapped the trajectory of technology, as you say. When you first kind of came into this world, it's Commodore sixty four yeah, and yeah. dial up internet connections. Yeah. Um, but I think anyone at that point would have probably imagined where we are today, um, with any kind of real set. You know, it's it's, it's, it's almost science fiction. Yeah, what, what I, kind of happens today compared to what we moved. If you try to think, thinking. yeah, back when I started, you try to think what you have today. I, mean, I, was, I still remember in um, in Treasury, it was a big thing of going physical service to virtualization was a thing, mm. right? Like and we we were we were all um, so excited. We actually had you know made the whole server room going from like we had like twelve racks full of servers down to like four, right? So yeah, yeah. It, was, it was this amazing thing of called VMware that came along and you know, transformed the whole the whole landscape. So. And you think, but technology is always, always there's always something that comes along and evolves and, and changes the whole industry, right? So, be it cloud computing, be it Gen AI, whatever it is, yeah, yeah there's always something that comes it, along, it, it, and, and it never that's, stops. That's the exciting part of being in technology. I think is that you're always, um, always exposed to something. When you think you just say you cross it all, something exactly new right. comes along and it changes the whole journey again. You, you sort of you just you traject yourself forward. Yeah, hundred percent. And you. Um, Again, you took another big step when you left Treasury uh, and you went to health. <laughs> yep. You are collecting another one. But, I did, yeah, I did. Um, and you actually, and again, infrastructure manager, but yep. again, a much bigger role. I think I read 57 locations, including Northern Territories, 50 staff, 16,000 users, 600 servers. It's big. It's, um, it, yeah. It was every every public hospital in um, in South Australia, essentially. So a large, large department, probably, probably the biggest going department in, in South Australia. Um, again, that was 24 by 7. Yeah, top of top of an environment, um, and again, and, and very, very real time, very real time implications. Not not um, not following proper processes and governance and procedures, right? Because it's exactly right. I was going to say that it's even more critical than the police at this point. Yeah, very because much, yeah. you're talking about saving lives fundamentally yep. on an operating table. Hundred uh, percent. I think that the biggest thing I learned from that from that role was was um, well, definitely pe people leadership was a was a big part of it. Um, <laughs> dealing dealing with doctors. By this point, I dealt with police police people. Uh, Ministers yeah. of, of government now now as doctors, um, so you know in, in lots of different personalities there. Some some and obviously some very strong personalities and some of those some of those different <laughs> careers, right? Um, but you know, interesting enough, it, I think the biggest one I took away from that was was around um, <coughs> was probably learning around technology how we have to pivot to support business, business outcomes, right? So which which I know sounds very straightforward, but it's it's you know think you think in the hospital. You go. Well, we need to do a change, a change, you know, change request to upgrade, you know, a network switch stack or something, right? Now it sounds pretty straightforward. You, you normally would just do it out of hours when there's no impact, but in the hospital there's no out of hours because it's open yeah. twenty four hours, twenty four hours seven, right? So you're sort of working through, and you sort of got, then it starts linking back to well, 
you actually start talking to the stakeholders and go, well, what, when is your quiet time in the emergency department, right? When can I actually take the stuff down to patch yeah. it? So you start finding out things like, you know, 4 a.m. on the Tuesday morning is the quietest time, which is which yeah. is <laughs> interesting knowledge if you ever have to go to the hospital, try to go yeah. in at that time. But um, the but you start to pivot your way you where you um, engage your stakeholders around, around that you know, whole change management journey and, and how you might actually yeah. want to, to do technical change. And you just also start to challenge the technology team around, well, do you need to do that change, right? Because I know... Because the technologists, we always want to, we always want to do the upgrade and have the latest of everything, right? Because that's yep. what technologists are. But then you having that conversation, well, because every we introduce anytime you introduce change, it's risk. Yeah. So yeah, well, do you, do you, do we actually need that? Like, so yeah. and does you really need to upgrade that? You know, normally in most jobs you go, okay, let's go, let's go to the latest and greatest. Yeah, we're all good. But in that kind of environment, right? It's actually change is it's actually a, a risk you don't want to introduce. So, um, right. so, so it's, it's a different safety, lens. Safety there. critical change fundamentally, right? As yeah. In, yeah. The, the the system and the process has to take precedent over the over the change itself. Yeah. Um, at this point, you, you you really starting to establish yourself as a leader. Um, was there a, a type of leadership style that you kind of found yourself gravitating towards? Uh, look, it, it's 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 pretty evolved, I think, as my career has evolved, my leadership mm -hmm. style. So I think I think initially um, when I was, when I was new, new to leadership, probably probably from you. Know, um, I probably say SA Health. Um, I would say probably, probably pivot, probably start to change a bit after that. I would say it's more leading by, you know, being being the technical smartest guy in the room still, top of top of mentality. You know, and yeah. you wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Definitely not the smartest guy in the room these days. But um, but back then it was kind of that's, that was the leadership style of hey, we should have you thought about doing this? Have you thought about doing that? Let's just go change this. That kind of you know, and look back in hindsight now and go, I probably wouldn't have said half the stuff I said as I did back then. So because you, you know, as, as you evolve and mature. Um, you learn, you learn different. You know, everyone has a different personality, and and yeah. back then, look, some of my staff probably would love the direct. Let's go get X done, but some will look, wouldn't look right because some will go, oh, this is, this is, you know, I want, I want to be a bit more. We want to think about it, do some more evaluation, that kind of stuff. So I think these days I'm more of a. I, I like to, I guess my main main way I like to challenge the problems now is, um, I like to let a lot, a lot of my leaders in the room have a discussion, um, right, which I facilitate. But really, really, I want them to. To flesh to talk about flesh it out and then, then really I, I'm there to provide um, some some either a nudge in the right direction at the end or I'll hopefully get them to land on the decision that yeah that they want to land on that we need to land on right so it's more facilitating um, so more of the, I'm now I'm a lot more consultative yeah facilitative um, instead of more directive I'd treat it as probably more of a you know how I used probably used to be so um, pretty more of that collaborative type of leadership style now yeah okay. Um, I noticed uh, uh, when I read up on you that around that time you completed the Dale Carnegie training. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what kind of motivated uh, you to kind of go down that path? Yeah, it was just. Um, I think by that point it was I hadn't, really had the, I hadn't completed a lot of formal management training by that mm. stage. I, I was just sort of learning on the job, right? Yeah. And that's how most of us learn. If you go back to if you're talking to an HR person, the, yeah. there's, there's the whole you know seven percent on the job top of model, right? Yeah. Um, but you know, but you get to a certain point. And go, you, re you really need to do some type of formal training. So around just 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 understanding some of those those key concepts of management and leading people and, and leadership. So now that was quite useful. Um, just just to help. Look, some of the stuff you probably go into that course and go, oh, that makes sense. I've been doing that anyway. I'd probably just yeah. call it something different. Yeah. Okay. Um, or maybe I call it the same. But <coughs> it, it, it just helps reinforce some of the things you're doing. And there's a lot of things you do in that course uh, where you just go, oh, actually, actually, um, that's a great idea. Or yeah, how can you introduce those? And you can you guys build on that over the years as you go through to and, and um, implement it. Yeah, look, I think it's great. I think um, you know a lot of tech leaders that I meet with they, at that point they're probably going off and doing a master's in information technology, or they're really starting to strengthen that side of or their business skills. And I know you did that as well. Um, but I was just really I thought that was excellent. I thought it was really yeah. interesting in the way that you really decided to lean into the the human side, if you like, and yeah. the way the ability to communicate and influence with people. Uh, I think is is really important. I think it goes back to the bit. What what do I really enjoy about my job and every job? It's, it's always the people side. Yeah. Um, so I think that's that's why I pray I pray gravitate towards that as well when I, when I look at my um, look at the certifications I've, I've completed. Yeah, fantastic. Um, you, you then shifted kind of from state government to local government. Um, into a, a kind of role there as head of information technology, but you yep. then a few years after that, you you left South Australia. Yeah, maybe you've run out of government departments to work for. I'm not <laughs> quite sure. But <laughs> you could, you could. Yeah. And uh, you you moved to Melbourne. What what kind of motivated that move? Uh, it was, it was no, probably probably two two things. Well, one was one was uh, personal circumstances. So yeah. so with um, 
with my you know, personal relationships at the yeah. time and how, how that kind of changed, um, I was like, that was probably time for a bit of a fresh, fresh start for, um, for just, just change of scenery. Yeah. Um, and also at that point, you're kind of like, well, what, what, what do I go back to after that, right? Do I, do I really want to keep working in local government? Do I go back to state government? I kind of feel like I've already done that. Yeah. Um, I ticked that off. You know, nothing, nothing gets working for state government. It was, it was had some great, great experience. There with some great people, but um, you kind of hear the point of, well, you know, I want to do something different. So uh, yeah, at that point, I decided you know, Melbourne, uh, probably because it's, it's it's the closest to Adelaide. Yeah, it's easy to get back home to see see the, my parents and the rest of the family. Um, and at that time, your friend network. So um, it's yeah. you know, flights are cheap. You can drive across. You know, that kind of Sydney was yeah. it was 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 yeah. a bit further away. Um, you know, at the time, I didn't really think about cost. The cost of living wasn't really a thing you're thinking about then, right? You kind of just yeah. think, oh, what, what you think about travel, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, but you know, it was it was more just it was closest to Adelaide. So I decided to come across to Melbourne. Yeah. And establishing that, and I, this is from personal experience too, establishing yourself in a new place, a new city, um, it's not easy. You know, you've got to build no. those networks and the connections and all those kind of things. How did you, how did you kind of go about doing that? Yeah, that was a good, that was a good, um, good question. So, you know, because you, you lose, you lose all your, all your, all your personal, personal relationships too, or your friends mm. and stuff like that. Um, you, know, you always say before you leave, we'll catch up all the time for beers, but you kind of do maybe for the first six months, but then, then you just get busy, right? So it's just not real, not realistic. And then, um, and you, and you also lose all your professional contacts. So if someone goes, you know, in your last job, someone goes, oh, we need a great security architect, we need a great cloud architect. You go, oh, I know someone. Um, but you change cities, you go, well, I can't call that guy in Adelaide to go come across to yeah. Melbourne, right? So you lose all your professional contacts right. too. So I think a lot of the times we get to more senior roles, a lot of it's around, um, it's all around, well, you, it's your knowledge of the industry and, and also your contacts of who can come and solve certain problems. It's, it's a big part of your, big part of your remit. So, um, that, that was that was challenging. I think through that it was really around uh, a couple of things. One is the because um, it's hard in uh, in a leadership role in a company. You, ca- you can't make you can't really make a lot of friends, right? Because because you, because you, you're, you're if you're a leader, you can't go you can't go out and be friends with your staff. And then if you have to turn around and, and make a decision that you have, if the company says we're going to downsize to twenty percent, you can't go. Oh, sorry, everyone. But it's, it's, yeah, you just yeah. can't you can't do that, right? So um, you can definitely hang out with them, and you can go out and have like lunches and after drinks and all that kind of social stuff. But you, you but you're still you're still in work mode, right? Still work yeah. Simon, right? So, you, so it's more. I went. There's this. There was this app. Well, back app back then. Uh, I think we would meet up or something. Okay. Um, you hold, you hold about that. You got to use different things. So I joined like a craft beer group in Melbourne, went to those different yeah, breweries right. around and talked to people about beer, and then a coffee meetup group. Um, and you just you just go out and meet people, right? So you're networking, um, and then then you get a bit more established, and you sort of you sort of get your area. Um, you know, I um, I ended up ended up picking you know picking up, like a, I ended up at a, a pub. They you know, go, ended up going to fairly often as well, only because they played because like, because I'm from Adelaide. They played um, I go for Port Adelaide for my football team. Okay, they actually pleased to play that football game when the Port played yeah. in in there on the, on the screen <laughs> with the sound on. So yeah. that's the only reason I used to go there right originally. But then you sit there and watching the football game all the time every, every week when the football season's on, and you end up talking to all these different local people as well. And you end up, you end up having a, you end up building a network there. So um, yeah. you can't end up building that that support that friend network. Right? So um, it sort of just grows from there, to be honest. Yeah, it's great. Do you think you would have got to where you got to today if you'd stayed in Adelaide? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I honestly don't know. I just pro- probably 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 I don't no. I don't think I don't think so. I think I think the the challenge the challenge with um. When you change states, especially especially you're looking because you know Australia is really as much as we're a very big country, you know the, the bulk bulk of the uh, the large companies are really Melbourne and Sydney, right? So, um, and look, you know COVID changed that, but this is pre COVID, right? COVID, did, yeah, COVID yeah. didn't exist back then, just like Gen AI, AI didn't exist either. Right? So <laughs> this is all before that. Um, the um, yeah, I think so. I think coming across there's lots there's a lot more opportunity, a lot more exposure. Um, being able to work for some of the larger companies, I, I think that that definitely definitely helped. Um, Def- definitely help get me to where I am today. Um, I know, like in my last role, for example, um, uh, that that wouldn't have because um, their office was basically Sydney and Melbourne, that, and that was this was pre-COVID. There was no, yeah. they would have hired someone in Adelaide back then to work for, for them. You know, yeah, they probably would now, but, yeah. but this is this is pre then, pre then, yeah, right? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, Sydney definitely helped. Yeah, it's interesting. I think um, you're the you're the tenth Titan we've sat down with, and I'm pretty confident. I was just trying to reflect as you were answering that. I'm pretty sure. Every person we've met with at some point has worked or lived somewhere else, yeah. um, as part of their career journey. So it's uh, it's an interesting trend, in terms and and I think part of that is probably having the pro social skills to reestablish yourself somewhere, um, and it teaches you I think a lot about who you are and what you stand for as well. Yeah, it does. It's, it's it does. not it's it's not as easy as it kind of looks on on, on face value. Um, and I could see that when you got to Melbourne, 
uh, you did a, a kind of contract role there with Court Services. Yep. Um, and then you joined Defence Health yep. as CIO, your first CIO yep. role. Uh, yep. So you kind of fulfilled that that uh, that ambition. Um, and ha- how did you know it was time where you were ready to step up into that CIO role? Uh, it was a good, it was a good one. It was. Um it was well two two things. I think I had a um I had a great great mentor when I got to Melbourne. I was also I found a I found a great mentor to, to leverage as well. Um, you um yeah you, know, you, you, just, you just bounce ideas off of and, yeah. and, and get feedback on. Pretty similar to how I used to do the IT manager back in back in school, right? So um, which which was also important um to have that contact. And then um it was just a, you know you sort of evolving the the the, ro- the contract role at Courts Victoria was a um was a business engagement role. So again, very people focused, very yeah. strategic. It was also around the time that courts were separating from governments. It was around how we actually built the IT yes. department. Um, we had to hire the CIO to come in. You had to, you had to meet all the different all the different um, courts. You know, the different CEOs, the different IT managers that they had, and look at how you could actually bring all those different strategies together. It's a, lot of, a lot of strategic work, a lot of vendor management, strategic uh, strategy, uh, risk, stakeholder management. So a lot of those, a lot of that work around that, right? Which is also the um, it's almost the foundations of a CIO role, right? If you think, what, mm. what does a CIO really do? A CIO is across lots of different things and deals with stakeholders every day, but you're also across the budget, the risks, yep. stakeholder management, you know, and, and, and beyond that, everything else flows in there, like security flows off that data, et cetera, right? But, but essentially, the core mandate is essentially you, you sort of own the own the um, the people side, the stakeholder side, the, the risk side, and, and that's essentially what that role was at, at courts. Got so it. it was... Um, so it's like a, a, a preparation role. It, it was. I think. I think the roles. You look at, like, I think you, when you look at your career, there's two types of roles you either have. Right. You have a, a learn role or an earn role. You, <laughs> might, you, might, you might have both, which is yeah. great. Yeah. But generally, you have a role where you're learning something, and you, then you learn. You, you sort of you capitulates you up, capitulates up. Yeah. Uh, and then you, then you start earning. That's your earning role, right? Because you get all the experience yeah, right. you've learned from that. And you start earning, and you start maximizing the value from that role. I'm not saying we don't learn in every role because you do. Like, you know, let's be realistic. But there's also the, you, you just swings more towards one or the other yeah. with, with, with the it's interesting. Um, so um, and you know, look, some people get lucky and get both. Yeah, but generally it alternates between you know one, one or the other. Where you've you've learned a lot, and then you go to the only bit. Yeah, right? and I think that that court one was more a lot, a lot of the learning, um, which which really taught me a lot of the foundations, foundation fundamentals I needed. Um, and I ended up getting that 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 CEO role. It was, all, it was all through my network. So in Melbourne, so that wasn't wasn't advertised. Um, it was it was through. Sure, the networks I built um, professionally yeah. um, at the time, and they were looking uh, at another professional contact I knew uh, knew of me. Uh, I knew they were wrapping up the project, uh, so you know, I was probably coming out to be probably available for something soon. Yeah, um, they weren't a recruiter; that was just a, just a general, just a, just another IT professional contact. He, he put me forward, and we had a coffee and a chat, and you go from there. So, um, and obviously during that time, there's there a lot of um, preparation through the you know three or three or four rounds of interviews I had to do. For that role as well, with my um, with my mentor, I had here too. Yeah, great. Around you know what what would how would I do this and position that, and <coughs> just doing some, some some question prep, um, because you know in- interviews are always um you know, always always um challenging. Yeah. Not not because they not because they're hard <laughs> to answer, just because it's it's challenging to go well what what's what's the right level of information you want to give, especially when going for a CIO role. It's 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 a, it's a different men- different mentality, right? So you're you're stretching yeah. yourself a bit. Yeah. Right. Um. I read in that role uh, that you improved employee engagement from fifty-eight to ninety-eight percent. Yep, yep. Um, that's an incredible achievement. Yep. Um, how, how did you go about doing that? I know people uh, skills is one of your strengths. Part, part, touched on that. Yeah, really. I think part, part of it, you know was was was, was a well, let's face it, was a low baseline when I came in because fifty-eight percent is not not great. If, if, yeah. if anyone's got fifty-eight <laughs> percent, it's just you know you don't, you don't, it's not what you want to be. Ninety-eight percent is probably probably above above average. You know, we're, we're pretty happy if we get eighty percent, right? We're, we're happy right. in the eighties. We're pretty happy with that. Yeah. So you know that was and that. Took took a while, you know. I, I wouldn't say I went in and that was three months later. That's the score we we're getting. Like, it yeah. definitely wasn't that because when you come into a new role, it's, it's all about building trust. So the staff don't know who you are. They yeah. don't know anything about you. Or they get some blurb from senior management saying we'll hire this guy. Here's their background, right? That's essentially you know what does this guy really know, right? So you, you have to be of that. So um, you know you're coming in there. We have to be of a review. Um, look, you, you know you do have to let people go and hire new people, and there's always that kind of shuffle that comes through. Um, you always want to try to avoid it where you can, but it, it's unfortunately some people just don't want to come along on the journey. So once you get through that, it's then how you actually rebuild the team once once you get through that initial initial shuffle that you have to do, shuffle the deck, deck, deck chairs. And it's about you know it's just going back to just doing how we actually did um, how we used to run the run run the run the team culture right. We used to do a lot of um, 
We used to love things like called shout outs. We used to shout out when someone's successful. We used to we used to celebrate their successes as, as a whole team. So someone got good feedback from anywhere. Do you know what they were doing? We we, we as a whole team we celebrate that. So yeah. and you do things. It was either like a morning tea for the entire team. That went, I went and organised that, that. Or we had a um, we had just had a shout in the meeting, and we had well, we had a bunch of you know a bunch of coffee, whatever it was. Um, after work drinks. That didn't really matter. It was just more just just taking the time to recognise that success. Yeah. Um, a lot of companies I think even now. Uh, in, in, my, in all my roles since, I've always always advocated for um, taking the time to celebrate your wins because we're always busy, right? There's always yeah. work coming through. It's never ending with the technology. It's just yeah. a constant demand <laughs> pipeline. You have to take the time with your staff to celebrate those wins. Um, I always just forget, and then, and people like, people people like being recognised, right? Even if it's, even yeah. if you can't financially do it, um, obviously you can do that too. Um, but sometimes it's just like say, hey, you know, hey, Anton, you did a great job this week at this at the all, at the all hands meeting, right? And saying, and because you got some great feedback from. This person over here that, that really loved the way you, you, you helped them out, went above and beyond, and you, you explained the situation. And people go, oh, that's really, you know, people just, people just love you see the recognition. Love the recognition, right? So, um, a lot of that, you know, a lot of ways we did, um, did a lot of team, team, team building exercises, especially after when I first started, just to get that get the team together and, and working well. A few off sites. Um, we hired a really good, really good um, facilitator who was a comedian. So, external facilitation is great. I always, always advocate. Um, as, as a senior leader, you probably can run your team off sites, but should you run your team off sites? Because That's a good question. Yeah, because then you're not really part of the team, right? The CEO is as a facilitator, yeah. not as part of the team. You want to build that bond and that as a team. So you, you're best off getting a, t- a external facilitator in to go just to run it. Not because you can't. Yeah, I agree. It, I think there's also a degree of maybe cynicism from the group of that book. So I think, am I, are we kind of having subliminal messaging yeah, yeah. put onto us? Is, or it. really is this about, you know, a kind of team building moment? Plus, plus, then the facilitator you can give them some permission to go. You know, they, they can they can make fun of you a little bit too. Yeah, because all fun making fun of the boss, right? So you yeah. know, it's it's, it's and you, you take it in good 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 fun, right? <laughs> so, um, so that, that yeah, that was that was quite that was quite good. And a lot of those types of things, you know, introducing like regular meetings, stand up, skip 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 coffees are quite good. Where you catch up with all the staff across, so it's not just yeah. going through the normal structure. Um, that you so you're, you're very approachable, right? Um, having having very good structure around that. Um, uh, your, your leadership team, knowing, knowing what are the North Stars, I think that's also yeah. quite critical having high engagement as well. Because if people don't know what they're doing, or they feel like the work they're doing isn't isn't, isn't valued, or it's not yeah. you know, really not shifting the dial with the company, it also it's, it's disheartening, right? So um, it's how you actually build that build that as well to stay yeah, well. Great. You were uh, you were in that role for almost five years, which yeah. I think uh, personally, I think in a first CIO role, I think that's a really good tenure because. And the reason I say that is I think it gives you enough time to kind of go in, appraise the situation, build your plan, build your strategy, execute it, see it through, and then see the impact yep. of the next phase. I think five years is a is a, it's probably longer than the average tenure in most roles, but I think for a first CI role, I think that's yep. really important. What uh, aside from the employee engagement, what what would you be most proud of that you achieved in that role? Uh, I think for that one was the um, was when I. Uh, Placed in the uh, the top fifty CIOs in twenty nineteen from so my last last year there, and it was really just because the, the, it was because of the full execution of the strategy. So yeah, yeah when, when we came on board, um, we were very very active. Technology was very traditional in there. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a very old we had old no, nothing was in the cloud, nothing was modernized. You know, so it was a whole journey towards modernizing the entire environment. Um, putting in putting in process automation, putting in CRM tools, think of your customer stuff. Um, putting in di- digital platforms, mobile apps, new, you know, yeah. claim, claim, you know, what, you know, claim automation as well to improve efficiencies across the company. Um, so that whole that whole journey of digitizing the journey, yeah. Um, you know, how we can reduce fraud, for example, as well. We're use, using it wasn't AI back then. These days, you would be very yeah. different, right? But um, the approach back then was was also um, how we could you know streamline and automate claims was was the big thing for health insurance, um, and and make the make the customer experience more more. More, more, more enjoyable, right? So, so we have yeah. we rolled that new claiming app, but then, um, that they could use, um, and that you know that was that was essentially, um, you know, I went from the from staying in the role, uh, building, building up the team's capability, building up the strategy of the of the, comp- of the tech strategy, um, getting the strategy approved by the board, uh, and then actually implementing the strategy. And I actually left That's at right. the end of that with actually the strategy fully implemented, um, and, and having been placed in the top fifty for some of the some of the projects we did, right? Uh, which was which was good. So it was good. It was a good. It was, it was still time to time to leave at the end of that, of course, because you kind of go, well, I, you yeah. know, what do I do now? Yes. Looking again, well, I left South Australia. Do I just stay here and, and rehash another five year strategy and, and re- replace? It's like, yeah, not not really. So yeah, it was kind of time to to take that. I was, I was going to take a you know, three or four months off as a break. 
that didn't happen. And COVID hit. I think Sorry. you left around that time. Didn't I did. You? Yeah, I was, it was, uh, it was finishing finishing. Um, I think February uh, just before COVID, and I was going to take time off. And then there was this, you know, this thing in China that was going. You can't even use a little bit. It's <laughs> yeah. kind of a little bit there floating there. And I planned a trip up to up to. Uh, we went to Rockhampton with the family um, in in March. So we, we I think we landed back in Melbourne like the week before they started changing mm. borders. Right, like it was literally yeah. the next week. So um, it was all, all crazy. Changed really fast, but. Um, I actually had just started a new role at pretty much the same time. So, yeah, okay. um, uh, with with the uh, with with Aware Super, um, yeah, and that was an interesting time because because yeah. it I was trying to kind of make sense of this. It it, it looks like you joined Vic Super as interim CTO, yep, yep. and then you that was four months before the merger with Aware yep, Super. Yep. And then there was multiple mergers. I mean that. There was a lot of happening yeah, in, was, that, in was. that sector at the time. It what, was. what kind of pulled you into those kind of roles? And well, originally, it was a, um, a recruiter called me up. Uh, I, finished, I, finished, I was finished, pretty much wrapping up at Defence Health. You know, I was going to take some time off. I already booked the holiday to, to Queensland with everyone. So, um, and then and paid paid got the flights. All booked, it was all there. So then the recruiter called me. Goes, oh well, this is interim role. Um, to, to to basically, we want someone to come in, run run the IT department. So as as, as this um, CTO. Um, Get and get basically get the merger across the line with 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 um, Aware Super. So, yeah. um, so basically it was like you know we, we, the merger's happening. Um, the, you know the, some of the execs have left before the merger. Essentially, what it was so there was the role that was they needed someone to come in just like keep the seat warm. Yeah, help out with all the obviously the people sides because there's, there's a lot of communication mm-hmm. around, we're merging. It's a merger of equals that kind of stuff, right? Um, doing all the people assessments, wh- which roles were done, which ones weren't matching, all that kind of stuff for roles. Um, all the contract and. Uh, all the contract management, bringing all the contracts together in the merger as well. So there's all that work around that. Plus, plus actually the whole technical project stream to create all the networks and machines together too, which ironically also ended up being um, driving uh, Vic Super's response to COVID too. Yeah, right. Um, because I also just pivoted as well. So we had to, help, had to do all that, but then also pivot to go. Well, how am I going to get the whole company to work remotely? Yeah, well, I've just started. So yeah. what, what do we actually have? How can you, how can you roll a video conferencing? Mm. Um, how we have everyone laptops? I've got all that kind of stuff. So. Um, it ended up being quite, quite, quite a. Yes, it was only four months, but it was a very, it was a very intense four months, mm. uh, and we actually, we actually had a fair bit to get done. So, and then you stayed with the Wear Super. I think yeah. initially I read as head of delivery, which in my mind almost looked like two IC to the CTO. It was, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was coming on across. They, they basically, um, they basically, uh, I stayed on uh, after the merger. They basically, they still looking at replacing their core platform. Yep. Um, they said, oh, well, you know, Simon, Simon in, in, my, in my last, in my last role, I did a lot of core platform, a lot of replatforming of core systems. And that's why I got into the top the top 50. So they were, oh, well, you've got some experience. That, do you want to come along and, you know, stay on? Um, yeah. So I you know, so went and stayed on with them aware at that time. And then we sort of did, we did a market. I was, I was really heavily involved for this six months, the next six months after the merger, which was pretty wrapping up the merger with Vic Super. So a lot of, yeah. lot of legacy work that came through. But also then really driving the... Um, Driving, working on the RF, RFP to go to the market scan, the the, te- the platform evaluation, the technical systems, um, be involved in that project. So, um, and you eventually ended up as CTO there as well, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, was that again kind of part of the plan? Do you think? No, no, it wasn't. Wasn't part of the plan. My, my the original plan was um, for me to come in there, be in the RFP, and then for me to drive the um, to drive the delivery of the new core platform into into Aware Super. Yeah. Right. So in that, that's actually where I was the head of the IT delivery role was there. I got put into that role. But then what actually happened was was because COVID hit, it changed everything, right? So like, I couldn't. It was a Sydney head office for aware. I couldn't travel there. I think I met my met half, and my team was split across Melbourne and Sydney. Met my met my team for the first time in December, twenty twenty. Yeah. When I when we let, let us yeah, out for yeah. a little bit, um, so it was it was and it changed everything. And, and then because because I couldn't get a lot of exposure across the business. The CEO of um of of aware at the time said, well, to the CTO, um. We know we know we hired someone to do this, but he had, he hasn't had exposure to anyone because of COVID. Right, he's been stuck in stuck in Melbourne and working remotely. You know everyone because you're been here. You know all the stakeholders, how we work. Can you drive the project? Um, and and he, he, he said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll drive the project. So he, he stepped across as the, as the as the exec, you know, tech tech owner and tech leader of that project, and, and sort of. And he said, well, Simon, can you be the can you be the uh, actually acting CTO for the next mm-hmm. well, what two and a half? Two and a half years, I think it was. Yeah. Um, while we delivered the project, so that's that's how I first got into that role. Yeah. So it was, okay, um, so that makes sense because I. Yeah, so it was an interesting one. Kind of, kind of, was, was probably never really planned to be that way. Yeah. Because you know, being being head of IT delivery, you know, it kind of made logical sense. You see, over of a, of a you know reasonable size health fund, but then going to um, head of IT delivery for for a um, the third third largest superannuation fund, 
Yeah. yeah it still, still makes perfect sense. Um, and it's kind of just, just how it kind of evolved with COVID, to be honest. It, it, it's obviously the, 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 the chance of uh, ego getting in the way of those kind of decisions. Uh, how was that kind of managed between you and the, the existing CTA? Uh, that's, see, that's where stakeholder management comes in, right? So, yeah. so again, you, you can't, you can't, you just can't. We, there's no room for ego, right? It's, it's, you yeah. think that the more, one thing I've learned over, over, over my career is, is that the more, the more humble you are as, as a senior leader, the, the better outcomes you generally get. So, yeah. Um, and I think it's just being, you know, being very, very mindful of all that, and obviously where you, where you, where you, where you come from as well. Yeah. Um, but you know, looking at looking at the, you know, for us it was well. We, we had a good working relationship. And that was because we had to work at it, right? So we had we had regular regular catch ups. You know, I was always very conscious. All right, well, you know, I'm 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 acting this role. Yes, it was two and a half years. So it's, it's kind of a bit weird because you're you know, no one really acts that long normally yeah, in the role, right? right? So it's kind of like, well, by making decisions, I have to make I have to make decisions. I have to drive mergers. I have to do. But you're, but you're making decisions that will have long term effects for the company as as a CTO. So it's kind of. Um, knowing, I guess knowing knowing how you have how you could trust each other. So we built that trust up. So um, he had trust in me that I was gonna not gonna hand him back at the end of this project a, a, a smoking plate. Uh, at the same time, you know, I had, I had trust in him that I was um, empowered to just go off and just do what you had to do, right? So that was all how you build that relationship together. Yeah, of course. And uh, more recently, uh, at the end of last year, you joined Cbus Property yeah. um, as, as as CTO, um, which we've talked about previously. It's more CIO, but I think CIO is reserved for the chief. Uh, investment officer, yes, investment officer. So yep. a pretty important job in those businesses. Same, same with the same with the way of super as well. So yeah, yeah <laughs> it's the most important roles. Um, and I'm not going to really dwell on the details too much because it's still, I guess, you're still relatively new new into that role. But I'm interested in uh, kind of looking ahead. You know, what what excites you about technology right now? Yeah, I think think in general, you know, t- technology, the technology and technology industry. I mean, you think it's, it has to be. You know, everyone says it all the time, right? Which is why I was. It's almost like transformation from five years ago. We haven't said transformation, but it's more. Um, it's just, just you know, the Gen AI, Gen AI, Gen AI stuff. Yeah. And, you know, you know, and I, that's why I said I don't want to say because everyone talks about it, right. And every vendor at the moment calls me and says I got some Gen AI plat- enabled platform, <laughs> which is also frustrating. But um, it, it's more. It's, 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 it's the start of what that's going to be going to be enabling down the track. It's almost like I almost think of it as almost going back to the, you know when VMware came out and they brought on the whole and you go from all these physical servers and racks to all sudden we can sell it yeah. right down right that. that it is, it is truly transformational. What's going to happen? Um, so I think it's how we actually how we actually position the companies now to understand how they can actually leverage it. So there's a lot there's a lot of hype out there. I think yeah. I think if you, look, you know we're pretty much we're pretty much at that that, that peak of that hype cycle, yeah. And, and the rounds of everyone's going, oh, hey, I can do all this stuff. But I think the reality is going to start to set in the next next couple of years when you start to sell into well, actually this is what I can do. This is what's good at doing. Um, Overlaying all that all that other stuff. You know we can't forget there's there's obviously you know, enterprise risk views across it. There's costs. There's yeah, you know, there's also the fact that you know some some jobs are just actually better off being being manual. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong yeah. with a manual process. As the technology just to know we might say the other way. We try to automate everything and make everything technology wise. But I know you know in some roles I've been in, we we you know, the technology team comes back to me and goes, oh, it's going to take us four weeks to write a script to automate to migrate this data from this system to this system, right? You ask, okay, I talk to the business and go, well, how long will it take if we got some data entry people to do the data? Oh, it takes take us two weeks. It's like, well. Yeah. What's the what's the cost of both? Oh, well, we we'll go with, go with the manual process, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think it's just understanding how can Jedi enable us, and that goes back to to what companies do today. And my advice for that's really you know, look look at your data, right? So your data yeah. your data is going to be the key to how successful your AI AI transformation is going to be. Because if you if you have poor data, decentralized data, yeah. um, data you don't you know what what the, what the quality is, that's what AI is going to be using to understand make decisions for you, which which is you know. You got poor data going in. You have poor decisions coming out. Mm. Absolutely, I heard a I heard a wonderful metaphor. Um, I'm going to say it's by a guy called Michael Gillespie, who at the time was at Linter Energy. I'm not sure where he is now, but um, and we're talking about talking about data, data. Uh, and he said everybody wants their data to look like a lasagna, but it looks like a spaghetti bolognese. <laughs> That's true. And uh, I just thought it was such for for a non techie person or the truly techie person. I just thought it was such a great metaphor and a visual. Uh, to be able to kind of represent that, you like both, um, yeah. but yeah, yeah, that's right. We, do, we like both, yeah, like both. Um, but if you want to use it, it's probably got no, a little I, sign. It is. Right. No, it makes, makes, it's actually a really good analogy. So, yeah. um, but it is, it is key. I think people, people sometimes forget they get, they get caught in the hype cycle of of um, you know, AI and because ha- you know yeah, it's just right. go back as well. You know, ChatGPT um, did wonders for you know, AI has been around for a long time, right? You look at AI yes, history; right. it's, it's been I think I think I was reading a um, an article the other day. I was reading. Um, 
from a, from on, on LinkedIn that was an AI actually started in the fifties, right? There was a whole bunch of yeah. stuff that started back then, so it's not it's not really new. No, that's it's, right. It's just that the the the, um, the way that Chat, what ChatGPT can do, and how it's been adopted by the mainstream, um, and how quickly it was adopted, yeah. um, to get to a million subscribers was like what three days or something. Yeah. Um, you go back years ago, Netflix was what months. Yeah, that's right. So I think it's also the way we we, we, we use technology now. I mean, it, it, the smartphones sort of change a lot of stuff too, right? So yeah, it evolves you know, how 100%. we expect to use things. App, apps change how we expect it. Instant, instant, instant um, adoption, ease of use, um, the whole way of. You, I mean, we used to train people and how to use Blackberries and um, and other phones. We ran how to, how to execs. And now, now you would never train anyone how to use an iPhone, right? Like, well, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I was um, I was looking at a CRM software. This is going back about five or six years ago now. And uh, one of the questions from the stakeholder group was, you know, how are we going to train the people on how to use it? And the sales guy actually from the CRM company, uh, one of the best answers I've heard in a presentation, he said, you've got I don't know, 60 apps on your phone. None of them came with a training manual. Um, and software today should be like an app. Should be. You know, you know, it should be so intuitive to use that, yeah, there's a little help file, but you shouldn't need a, a manual on, uh, no. on on how to work your way through these things. Which, no. um, And that's kind of stuck with me, actually. It's stuck with me a long time since then and yeah. kind of looking at the way that we, we kind of use things and that kind of, I guess, the UI, the UX side of things as well is so I important. I think so. I mean, that's the other bit we'll come through. I think you, you said, if you, what, what's the job of the future? You're going to have, okay, you're going to have data, data's not going anywhere, security's not going anywhere. Um, <laughs> AI will probably have a, have a have an influx initially of probably more like those AI input engineering. So like you know, yeah. you have, just understand how you put the right inputs yeah, the right and get the right and so forth. Yeah. Look, we used to have jobs for that for between data into Excel, right? And that disappeared because everyone just knows yeah. how to use Excel now. So eventually, that will probably fade out to be more of a we just all know how to use it. Um, but it's interesting because I think if you look at and again, this is a generalization, but you look at the yeah. the casual user of ChatGPT, they're using it like Google. Yeah, exactly. But they're not actually writing a prompt. No, um, but it still works quite well, right? And that's because it's 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 <laughs> it's, 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 it's the, it's the uh, trade off between ease of use versus the actual um, you know what returns you have to get out of it. That's right. And and, and with you look at it, you, for most people, generally you're saying, hey, you know, write me a it was just, it's great, write me a job ad, right? Great for doing job ads on on, right. on as I'm sure you you might know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is there, is um write me a job? It's it's great stuff like that. And you don't have to have. There's no prompt engineering for that. So some of that, yeah. yeah. And that's why that's why that's why. Natural language AI is is, is such a um, it's such a powerful tool because you don't need to be trained in it or That's right. skilled in it or even a technical background. You just go, I want to do something, and the, and the language model picks it up and comes back with something that's pretty half decent. Like you yeah, might tweak it. Yeah, you probably got a better response if you had a better prompt at the start. In you know, it might take you four or five goes without having that right prompt to get to the right output you want. That's right. But still, overall, it's still pretty good, and that, I think that's that's the, that's the main thing. Yeah, hundred percent. Um. Mindful of time, I, 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 there's a few questions about your career that I'm quite keen to explore. Uh, I'm interested in how um, how important do you feel it was to develop that kind of deep experience in support and infrastructure to set you up for kind of where you've got to today? Look, it's a, um, probably, probably not so, all my, all my technical knowledge in infrastructure is probably almost, almost redundant, right? If you think of it these days, because cloud replaced a lot of it. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and being this being a CIO, you, you're you're not the smartest person in the room anymore, right? You know, and you, 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 there's no way you're ever going to, going to be. So there's, there's a lot, you hire a lot more smarter people in your team. They they, they have the depth of knowledge you just can't have because you don't have the time. You don't have the time to go across everything, right? Yeah. So so but but it did did teach me a lot around. I think you're looking at what do you still use from that. It's probably all around. Um, understand the technical language that you're still talking about. The, the language doesn't change, right? You're still talking yeah. about the same languages. You're still talking about how you might do, um, you know, there's stuff you learn about change management, release, um, budget cycles, capital investments. Well, that stuff you talk about a lot more now, you still had a lot more insight and understanding of back then. And you also still know um, when your team's turning at something, you know you know in your head how long it takes still, right? So you, you still <laughs> kind of know um, what, what's realistic and what's not. So you still have to build those foundations um, for you to leverage every day. You know, could, could I log on to um, Azure today and do do some stuff in it? But yeah, probably not. But it, but you know, but but understand you know, what, how how DNS works and how networking works and rally and that kind of stuff. You still understand the, the basics haven't changed in years. So. You, you basically back at your Commodore sixty four and you're gonna you're gonna yeah. go there and you're gonna break it and not better fix it. <laughs> you can get emulators for sixty four. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but you, it's just, so it's one of those things. And that's, but that's just, that's the five year old changes, right? It, it's yeah. your, your value the range of the business isn't around 
I'm I'm the smartest guy in the room anymore. And you have to be comfortable if you're a CEO, you have to be comfortable with that, that you're not the smartest yeah. person in the room anymore. Um, but you are essentially the conduit between technology and the business yeah. and you're there for your thought leadership. Yeah. Um, and, and mentoring and coaching. Yeah, great. And and through your career, um, I think you've very successfully navigated that in terms of the transitions from the next role to the next role and the kind of progression. But were, were there any kind of risks that you felt that you took that were particularly rewarding? Uh, look, I think I think moving to Melbourne was a risk. You're coming yeah. across with no 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 real job lined up, no 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 not knowing anyone. You know, it's just kind of a it's kind of a risk. Yeah, it's probably probably the biggest risk um, that I probably would have taken. So, um, but ultimately, you could probably argue that that probably paid off quite well. So, yeah. um, you know, it's it's one of those things where um, you know, sometimes you got you got to take a take a leap of faith, I guess, and, and trust trust in your own skills. Yeah. Um, that you'll that you'll find something and then and, and, and go from there. And when you're when you've been looking at opportunities that you've kind of gone through your career, how, how important is it for you to align your personal values with the culture of the organisation? Yeah, uh, it's it's well, it's very important. I, I think I think to be honest, the more senior you get, the more important it is. I'm not saying it's not important when you're, when you're so you're, you're, you're still, you got your first IT job. Yeah, you're probably just excited to have your first IT job, right? You probably go, well, look, the values of the company is is, is important. Yes. But, I'm, but I'm, I'm, it's more important that I'm, I'm learning new things, I'm getting some exposure, I got my first IT job. It's, that's, that's, that's probably the bit that you probably value the most. Yeah. Um, but but as you get more senior, you, you've obviously got that depth of knowledge and, and, and you're, they're, they're hiring you for different reasons, right? Um, and then the way you work and the way you like to operate has to be very well aligned to the company culture yeah. um, because that's ultimately, that's gonna be key to your success as, as an exec. If, if, you, if your culture is at opposite ends to how that company works, you, you're not gonna get along yeah, you, you know, even when you get along with your, your peers or your um, or your other senior stakeholders in across the organisation, you just don't want to look on the gel, and you won't resonate, and you won't you won't be successful. So, when, when you're looking at opportunities, how how do you assess the culture of the organisation to know if you're going to be a good fit? It's, it's a lot of um, a lot of research. So, no, I, don't, I don't really I don't really look at Glassdoor and stuff like that because I feel like it's pretty slight. You know, how often you how often you go anywhere and put a positive review on stuff, right? Yeah. Most of us generally put negative reviews on stuff when we're not happy with something. So it's more it's more What's that brand like in the market? Um, talking to people I know, um, so I know, I know you know, over, over, as you go through your career, you, your network gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know, and for me, it's mostly talking to if I want to get an insight into a company. That once you generally know the best about companies, I pray in the consulting professional services space because yeah. they're usually doing work. And if they don't know, they'll know someone who does know, right? So there's yeah, always somebody who right. knows through that. Um, yeah. Recruiters are probably another good one as well. Yeah. You know, so there's people you just get about out and about. And and during the interview, I think I think it's um, you know, don't forget it's a two way street. Feel, feel free that you have to you know, be asking those questions mm. um, about culture is important. So you know, my um my interviews in my current my current role and, and my previous role is it was a lot of it was around around um the way it was was all around culture. Yeah. So not so much, you know, not not so much how you know, what's the team, what's the technology using, not not really that. It's more around, you know, um, you know, what in your view? What, what do you think works really well with the team? Do you see any areas for improvements? Um, you know, it, questions like that. Trying to get you know, from different angles for different people in the interview panels, because you want you want to suss out. Well, <coughs> are there any, what what's, what what's, what is the team like? Because if what yeah, the team's right. like, Jimmy's a good insight to what the culture's like. So yeah, that's right. Um, it's uh, to me, it's always a red flag when a when a company says, "Oh, we've got a great culture." And you say, "Well, what, what, what does that mean?" And yeah, then, I mean, and they say, "Oh, it's, you know, so we interpretive." Go, we go for beers. It's, like, yeah. it's, it's, not, it's not a great culture. No, no. Uh, well, it could be, but there's there's many other aspects that you, you need there's, to be able to describe it. I think, um, and it's something I always encourage people looking at jobs is to ask those kind of questions because, you know, the the well the the evidence and the data and the research shows that if you if you go somewhere where it's a poor culture fit, you're probably not going to be successful. I, I would agree with that research. I think I think it's key key to finding out a um, finding a culture that's aligned to, to you, right? So that, that sure. works, and the company works the same way you work, right? And and the yeah. way that you like to like to operate um, is, is, is 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 critical. Yeah, definitely. Um, moving through the gears a bit, uh, we uh, we're kind of shaped by the feedback we receive. Um, so, what significant feedback have you received in your career? Yeah, like, yeah, it's it's because it's, there's two types of managers, I think. Is there's the managers who just tick, tick the box in those in those discussions and give you generic feedback, which isn't helpful, right? So, yeah. like, and a lot, I think a lot of staff, unfortunately, have managers like that. We just go, look, it's just, yeah, you're doing okay, tick whatever, you know, that kind of thing. P- 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 to give really constructive feedback, I've probably never had two managers in my entire career, of of what 24 odd years, right, where I've actually had 
proper constructive feedback, um, which is then good because you can actually use it to how you can grow and develop yourself, right? Most of my managers probably just gave very generic feedback. Um, so it's it's you know it's it's key. One of those I think is around you know was was um, was a lot of the signs of it was pretty more around fine tuning. Probably my my writing style, I think, was what was one that came up when I got to more senior roles, because you when you start to write in a certain way, um, when you start writing stuff to boards and and executives, it's it's a different way of writing to how you might write stuff to yeah to um, technical stakeholders. I think the other, the other piece of good advice I got um, and feedback at the time was to um, you know, you, when um, don't get into a, a keyboard email fight with people. Maybe some of you, you disagree. You have some of those strong personalities, especially in technology. Yeah. Um, it, it's it, you know you can have those emails going back and forth, back and forth. Like it's just easier just to call just to call someone and have a discussion or yep. as a meeting, and not get not get pulled into those those back and forths, um, which was also quite quite helpful to to you know, get feedback like that as well. So it's um but yeah you know, it's it's very rare. I think it's very rare. I mean a lot, a lot of I think, but I also think it's good for employees. I think if everyone's, if everyone's listening to this podcast, so if you if you ever get positive feedback from your manager, I think you should ask for well, you know, well, I'm not perfect. No one's perfect, right? So, so yeah. there's going to be something I, you can see. Like, what should I improve on? What should I focus on? Yeah. And if, I think if you prompt the manager, they might feel more comfortable and they actually come back and go, actually, well, since you asked, yeah, um, I noticed that you um you you know, you 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 um copy me to me or whatever it is, right? And you go, oh, okay, thank you. You can actually get some feedback around actually how you might might grow. Absolutely, yeah, I think so. I think sometimes it's uh, it's also asking, you know, what's the one thing that I, I could have done to, to be more effective? Or That's what's it. the one thing That's on it. this project I could have done better? I think sometimes uh, people could be quite overwhelmed when there's been someone suddenly says, give me some feedback. Yeah, yeah of um, course. You kind of think, oh, hang on a second, I need to frame this right. That's it. Uh, so I think, you know, the framing of that question can, can help to get better feedback too. Yes, I, mean, I think, I mean, the time to do it as an employee, is, um, you can do it whenever, of course, but the yeah. time when everyone's in that mindset is during your your, PD, your performance review process, right? So yeah. we, all, we all get those. Um, you, you should get constant feedback anyway, but but you know if if through one on one. So it's, it, my always always every time I ask for feed, feedback or got feedback, it was either, either during a, a one on one with with my leader uh, or during the formal formal performance review process because you're both in that mindset. Yeah, I have one, have one good manager actually who always used to say his performance review process. He used to say um, how do you think you went. Yeah, for the year. That was the first before you give any feedback or anything. Is how you think you went, and you see, uh, you know, what, what, and then what do you think your top achievements were for the year? And he, says, and he goes, what do you think your, your areas for improvement would be for the year? And then you did most of the talking, right? And then you can you kind of provide a bunch of coaching and, and discussion around well, actually, yeah, I agree with that, and but you know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's um, clever. Which is a way to do it. Yeah, it is good. Um, if you had uh, a piece of a singular piece of sage advice that you were giving to someone that's kind of in that desktop support role in a school, uh, or wherever they are in their career, yeah, but they're, yeah. they're kind of looking to go forward. What 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 advice would you give to the next generation? I think the uh, the um, thirst, thirst for thirst for growth. You know, keep 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 to keep that drive to always challenge yourself and learn new things is is key, right? So, you know, you've you've got that that technology growth uh, at a junior level. You you probably where you're going to progress more. Like you start in a company to help desk role, right? You 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 get promoted because you're good at good at people skills and you're good technically. You'll get promoted up. Yeah. Same as desktop, etc. So, so the, the key thing is um, keep keep driving, keep keep the drive. But I think having a north star is, is key. And what what do you what do you want to be? Yep. Set some milestones for yourself, right? What what do you want to be by the time you're thirty? What do you want to yep. be by the time you're forty? Um, you know, I mean, you'll be realistic too. You can't be. Uh, I'm straight out of university. I'm going to be a CEO in five years because 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 that won't that won't happen. Not only crushing your dreams, but that's just really just really <laughs> that's realistic of it, right? So I think it's having realistic goals. Finding a mentor who can probably help you with those goals is also good, but I think it's um, looking how you can build those goals. You know, so you know, go well. My first role, I'm in help desk. You know, I want to get to desktop in the next three years. It's pretty realistic, right? A pretty realistic goal. And you go once you once you're in desktop, what are you going to do from that? Or if you're in, if you're in, if you're a programmer, you know, what what's the number school yeah. on school? You know, as a programmer, right? It's probably the communication, the stakeholder management side, because yeah. you, you work around a lot of other people who can program. But to get promoted in that area, it's around your stakeholder management. So you may go off and do a a people or leadership course yeah. um, or do some do some critical thinking uh, writing courses or business writing skills and stuff like that because if you didn't do that you distinguish yourself to everyone else yeah so, um, and you probably get promoted up to being a team lead role yeah. and, that, and that's a really good taste to go well do I like leadership or do I like being technical 
Because you have yeah. to have that challenge with yourself too, right? Around, well, what do I want to do? Wanna yeah, do? that's exactly right. I think uh, it, it, you're right. There's, there shouldn't be this kind of natural obsession with wanting to move to leadership because it's the, the perceived career path. I think it's being at a kind of be authentic to yourself yep. and, and what you want to do. I've seen a few leaders. I mean, in my career, there's been a, I've seen a few leaders who got to senior, who got to leadership roles because they were good at stakeholder management and technical, and then realised they actually hated it. Yeah, and then want to go back to being technical again because they call that the um, the, uh, oh, the I can't think of what the word is now, but it's like the promotion paradox. That essentially, people get promoted to the point of incompetence. Um, and that's the only way you find out is by keep promoting yeah. someone, and yeah. then fundamentally you've 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 potentially lost the talent because they've kind of ended up in the wrong place. Yep, um, and yeah. that's that's tough, you know, because you've got to push yourself out. Of your comfort it is zone. tough. I also think it goes back to again leaders not giving good constructive feedback. Yes, because I think yeah, that's the other thing, right? They promote people up because they're because either you know who knows they're in the blind or time or whatever it is. But it, sometimes sometimes it's also I like I've seen that happen a few times as well where, where people get people I call it the inverted pyramid. Where, where they just don't have the years of experience to, to, to build that foundation they need to be at yes. the senior role. Yeah, that's right. Because, um, you know, challenges get thrown at you and you have to think on the spot. You're in a room and you have to be able to pivot and have an answer. And yeah. you can't tell your staff, I don't know, because everyone's going, well, what do we actually do? You know, if, if yeah. you're entire, say all of a sudden you're, you're a network engineer, all of a sudden now you're, you're the head of, yeah. head of network for the and all of a sudden the whole network goes, and what are you going to do, right? Everyone's going, well, what's happening? You got the CIO calling you going, well, we need to fix it. You always pressure. You have to be. Able, you have to. Be, you can't go. Oh, I'll bring some consultants in, or I'll, yeah, that's right. I'll go off and think about it for a day and do a design. You, 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 just, you just don't have. You have to be able to pivot, and, and then ultimately, the only way to pivot and be comfortable with decisions you're telling yourself to do in, a, in that crap of crisis mode is when you is, is is experience. Yeah, because you're eighty percent sure, but usually when you have enough experience, eighty percent sure is good enough. Yeah, to get in there and get something fixed. Yeah, great. Um, look, final question. Um, I'm also interested in kind of personal development and how people kind of uh, develop themselves. Um, is there a particular book or you're reading or podcast you're kind of listening to at the moment? That you yeah, I, um, I, uh, I like listening to, from a podcast point of view, yep. um, is the, um, there's a podcast called Col Col Culture and Coffee okay. podcast uh, by, by Colin, Colin Dielos. So he's, yep. he's a Mel Melbourne Melbourne. Melbourne based, but every every two weeks he goes to a new cafe in Melbourne, tries the coffee, so it's actually interesting. Yeah, but he talks about the he talks about um, uh, leadership and and cultural change you can adopt as a leader inside your inside your team. Yeah, great. So there's been you know probably about 10, 15 minutes on the, on the coffee. So there's just a lot of the notes, the tasting notes, <laughs> the single order, that kind of stuff, so which is which is kind of you know being being from Melbourne now and then you know being really liking the, the coffee culture. But then it pivots as well and goes into just a, just a, just a tidbit around. Um, yeah, great. You know, how, how you might he might deal with a difficult stakeholder, or deliver projects, or he might drive cultural change, or he might do you know, deal with a um, deal with yeah, yeah difficult what we, so different scenarios every couple of weeks. So it's kind of a, it's good and it goes for about half an hour. So it's a it's a good break up between. Yeah, nice. um, so I usually listen to it in the morning on the way on the way in on the on the train. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for your recommendation. That's right. That's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, and look, thanks for your time today. I think it's been really insightful. And again, it's just. These are always interesting, just unpacking different journeys. Um, and yours, again, is a different story yet again. And it's it, it, it's fascinating to see where you've come from, desktop support from high school. Yeah, thank um, you. Yes, all the true. way through to where you've got to today, which I think is um, yeah pretty impressive. So, yeah, yeah congratulations. Thanks, Anton. No, thank you. And thanks, thanks for having me on. And I you know, really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, great. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Tales from Tech Titans. And be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcast. If you'd like to get more insights about tech careers, then check out the Ember, that's e -M -M -E -R, LinkedIn page, for the latest updates, articles, and engaging discussions.